Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Um, and on behalf of the Centre for Evaluation and Methods at the Wolfson Institute, Queen Mary, I wish you a happy International Clinical Trials Day. <laughs> Um, our centre's vision is to improve evidence and methods for a healthier, better world. And we do this through the combined strengths of our four fantastic units, including BART's Clinical Trials Unit, the Pragmatic Clinical Trials Unit, our Methodology Research Unit, and our Health and um, Economic Policy Research Unit. Our local community is the richly diverse East End of London which also includes some of the most impoverished areas in our country, and therefore health inequalities is close to our heart. We've built up expertise in this area to try and address this through our research. BART's Clinical Trials Unit has um, branches dedicated to cardiovascular disease, rheumatology, and cancer prevention, detection, and diagnosis. However, it's not just through these high burden disease areas that we can tackle health inequalities. And I'd like to invite Richard Hooper, our head of the methodology research unit to say a few words. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so I'm Richard Hooper. I'm a professor of medical statistics. Uh, among other things in our center with Beth who introduced herself in the moment, I'm a co-director of the Pragmatic Clinical Trials Unit. And we collaborate on a number of clinical trials, but in our centre, we're, we're also firm believers that uh, research methods and sound research methods have to lie at the heart of evaluations if they have quality and, and integrity. So one of the aspects of the work that we do in the Centre for Evaluation and Methods is to drive forward innovation in research methods and the implementation of sound methods. Uh, we'll hear this morning something about how methods can and, and should be used to help address health inequalities, for example. Um, I, I don't want to say much more for now, so I'm going to pass over to Beth. Thanks so much, Rian and Richard, and welcome to everyone who is joining us. Thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted that there's so much interest in clinical trials. So I'm Beth Stewart, and along with Richard, I'm the co-director of PCT, which is the Pragmatic Clinical Trials Unit. Um, so as our name suggests, we, we focus on pragmatic clinical trials. And what that is, is we're really interested in whether interventions have um, an impact in, in real everyday clinical practice. Um, so in healthcare and in the NHS. And that means we do a lot of work in areas like primary care, mental health, orthopedics and, and critical care. And so you can imagine that it's so important that, you know, where we're working at the front line of NHS services, that we're getting and delivering care to the full spectrum of patients who need it um, in all of their kind of glorious diversity and intersectionality and complexity. Um, and it's one of the reasons that, you know, we're so interested in looking at methods and techniques to ensure that our research is as inclusive as it possibly can be. Um, and so it's a really exciting theme for us today that sort of trades on the strengths of, of us as a unit, but also the community that Rian mentioned we're embedded in. So um, first up, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce to you Professor Sandra Eldridge. So Sandra um, probably doesn't need introduction to many of you. She is the former director of PCTU. She is a hugely experienced um, clinical trialist and, and an international expert in clinical trials and uh, particularly cluster randomized trials. Um, but she's also been a real advocate for inclusivity and diversity in clinical trials research. And she's gonna present to us today some of the findings from the included study that she led. Um, so Sandra, over to you to introduce your talk and, and share your slides. And if anyone has questions that they'd like to pose to Sandra immediately following the talk, please do pop them into the Q&A. Or if you have questions for our panel later on, um, do pop them in there and I'll be keeping an eye on that chat. So Sandra, over to you. Unmute myself. Thank you very much, Beth. So I'm just going to um, share my slides. We we initially said that what we wanted to do was to provide um, initial guidance because we were clear that this was only a, a, a project which had a small amount of funding um, and that we wouldn't be able to um, do everything that we would ideally have liked to have done around the, collect the collection of ethnicity data. What we did was three, um, there were three parts to the research. First of all, we looked at what's going on at the moment in terms of um, 
ethnicity data collection. And for that, we surveyed the clinical trials units in the UK. Uh, we sent um, a survey to all the clinical trials units in the country, the registered clinical trials units. Um, and then secondly, we wanted to find out how diverse ethnic communities felt about ethnicity data collection. And for that, we did a number of interviews and focus groups. And finally, we um, used the consensus process, which involved a consensus meeting, but actually in the end, there was a lot more um, around that than just the consensus meeting itself. So, um, sorry. And this just gives you a little bit more information about what we actually did in those three parts um, of the project. And they were all underpinned by our public advisory group, which was extremely important in this study. And I'll show you a bit about that on, um, uh, on the next slide. So um, we had 24 responses, that's a 55% response rate from CTUs. And we asked them to describe um, what they did in relation to collecting ethnicity data in some of their studies. And we got responses back for 41 studies. We then did some focus groups and interviews with some of those CTU staff, um, trying to find out a little bit more about um, what they felt about ethnicity data collection and how they did it. And um, we also emailed some trials related forums and had feedback from eight people with their views about ethnicity data collection. In the second part of the um, project, we did focus groups with um, 38 people in total, eight focus groups and one interviews. And these were members of diverse ethnic communities from across the UK. And we had a number of um, groups um, that we linked with across the country who were absolutely pivotal in this work in both finding uh, participants to be part of those focus groups and interviews, but also in the discussions that we had with them throughout the research. The consensus process, um, we involved diverse ethnic communities. And I've just highlighted that phrase in yellow here um, because one of the things that we recognized in starting this research was that uh, these diverse ethnic communities were underrepresented and underserved in research, um, but we also recognized that there was an issue with language. And so we asked, um, members of the diverse ethnic communities what they would like to be called. Um, ethnic minorities is not what most people want to be called. Some people use the term minoritized ethnic groups. There are a number of other um, terms around. What they preferred was this term, diverse ethnic communities. And so that's what we used. So our public advisory group um, was particularly important um, in this work, uh, and, and so were the, the groups there. You can see Social Action for Health, Caribbean and African Health Network, South Asian Health Action, and a Latin American community group through whom we um, found the participants for our focus groups and interviews. So we had this, um, the, the plan for our focus groups and interviews. We were going to identify people, then uh, do some planning, running and analysis. And I'm not gonna go through everything that I'm gonna put on the screen now in detail because of time, but um, we had a lot of input from these groups and also from people that I'm calling community connectors who were leaders in, um, in these, um, in these four um, groups who helped us to connect with our participants. And what they said to start off with was, if you're going to identify and recruit people, we need to do this a little bit differently than you would normally do it. So we did some video blogs, in, well, we didn't, um, they did for us some video blogs in different languages. Of course, we used translation, but we also used additional um, materials such as newsletters to advertise in community networks. And the sort of things that they said were really important in this work was building trust and acknowledging past mistakes of the research community. So we actually had a little video where we did that and we acknowledged some of the past um, mistakes that have been made in, in um, including diverse ethnic communities in research. 
Then there were a couple of um, groups that they thought that we had not included um, and could we include those in the research and the Latin American community um, was not a community that we initially went to, but after discussion, um, we decided that we needed a Latin American group um, included in the research and we had bilingual researchers. Um, and those researchers were from these four groups, those people from these groups who actually did the interviews and focus groups for us. One of the other things that we thought about quite a lot during the research was um, the definition of ethnicity. And the definitions, if you look them up, they're not consistent at all in the literature. But we rather liked this, and I, it's not a definition, it's a sort of description of what ethnicity is by um, Raj Bhopal, um, describing ethnicity very much as a multifaceted quality um, that refers to a group to which people belong or they're perceived to, to, to belong. Um, and it can be the result of many different shared characteristics that are not fixed or easily measured. So it, it's an imprecise and fluid um, uh, uh, a sort of characteristic, but it does differ from race, nationality, religion, migrant status, um, sometimes in, in subtle ways, but may contain elements of, of that. So that's what we're talking about when we think about ethnicity. So out of this work, we came up with some recommendations, 13 recommendations, and you can see from this diagram that they cover most of the research um, cycle. Um, but, but particularly at the beginning, identifying and prioritizing um, research and then um, further around the circle in undertaking and managing the research. So what I'm going to do is to talk about four of the recommendations, and they're really at the start of your research in identifying and prioritizing and designing. And um, then um, uh, go very quickly through the rest of the recommendations. So our first recommendation was to identify the diverse ethnic communities from which participants in the trial need to be drawn. This might seem um, self-evident that you would have to do that, but um, it's not always um, that straightforward. Um, and so we wanted to particularly put it in there. Now there's there's um, one, one of the reasons why we think this is particularly important is because of the views that some of the people in our focus groups and interviews had about the fact that the current um, uh, tools for uh, collecting ethnicity really didn't represent them. And so it's really important to have that conversation right at the beginning of the research so that when you design your um, data collection tool, you don't leave out um, or people who, who need to be included. Um, and um, you make sure that uh, the data is going to be collected in, in a sensitive way. But in order to do that, you need to know who exactly you're going to include in your study. Um, there's already the NIHR Include framework, which provides a, a list of, of questions for um, identifying who needs to be included in the study in terms of ethnicity. Um, so that's a very useful tool to use. But in addition to using it, it came out of the research that it was really important that it's not just the trial team who do that, but it's the trial team and these people we're calling community connectors, people who can really advise on how things look from a, a, a diverse ethnic community perspective. And the second recommendation clearly articulate the reasons for ethnicity data collection in the trial. Um, we want to make sure that um, in any research that what we do um, is going to give us the results um, that, that are going to be useful. So we want to make sure that our um, data collection, ethnicity and everything else matches the purpose of the study. Um, and it's really helpful, I think, and many of you on the call will understand um, this because of the studies that you've been in, involved in. If you're thinking about, for example, a primary outcome, 
there's often a lot of discussion about that and about, you know, why are we doing this study and therefore um, what's the best primary outcome? And we think the same should be true of something like ethnicity. We really need to think about why we're collecting ethnicity um, data in a trial. Interestingly, from the from the clinical trials unit data, um, only 15 percent of those 41 um, example trials that we looked at collected data because they wanted to use it in the analysis. People are more often collecting data because they want to show that their study is representative um, or they want to make sure um, that they're being equitable, all sorts of reasons like that. If you're doing collecting the data for that reason, um, then you may want to handle it in a different way than if you're actually going to put it in your analysis. So how to do this? Again, um, a focused discussion, um, similar to the uh, recommendation above, involving a wide range of people and also including those um, who are going to provide, um, uh, who are like those who are going to provide data and also, if possible, um, those people are going to collect the data, basically so that everybody knows um, that what, uh, what's necessary there. Third recommendation, if possible, engage with organizations or networks that connect relevant diverse ethnic communities with the research sector. And for this piece of research, we were connected with an organization called um, uh, Egality, and they work with um, ethnic, uh, diverse ethnic communities and diverse ethnic community groups across the country. And they were absolutely essential to making sure that um, we um, connected with the right people, but also they facilitated not only the connections, but good mutual understanding between us and the ethnic, diverse ethnic communities that were involved. And from that, uh, we're now doing another piece of work which involves Egality and some of these other diverse ethnic community groups. So it's built a long-term relationship there is NIHR guidance on how to do this, but it's really about involving individuals, whereas we were clear in our research that we wanted to involve um, uh, community groups as opposed to just individuals. Um, and so that takes a little bit more thinking about how do you find national, regional, local um, organizations, and it needs funding, it needs time, and it needs the building of relationships. And that's why we put within this recommendation if possible because we recognize the other demands on researchers time though we do think that this is probably one of the recommendations where we need a bit more structural change we need more funding we need more time um, we need um, more support to do this sort of thing and then engage individual patient and public members um, identified in diverse ethnic communities in the design of the study. Um, why? Well, we found that the diverse ethnic communities that we spoke to really wanted meaningful involvement and could, could give very helpful um, perspectives and perspectives that were different from the people involved um, in working for the organizations that we, that we went to. Um, how to do this? through organizations like Egality that I've just mentioned, but also use appropriate places when talking to patient and public members and um, increase the research opportunity um, and improve trust. And this is another quote, um, which I think some people are sometimes surprised at these sorts of, of um, uh, sort of feelings that, that, that people have. Um, and this is particularly about the term hard to reach. This is a researcher describing to somebody in a, in a diverse ethnic community um, about how, well, these communities are very hard to reach. And um, the uh, individual says back to the researcher, I don't think they're really very hard to reach, but have you got the right facilities or the right recruitment to reach out to these communities and bring them in? It's something that we need to think about. Um, a bit more. So I'm going to go very quickly. This is my last slide. I'm going to go very quickly through this. Um, so those are four recommendations that come at the beginning of our list of recommendations. Um, we also had a recommendation that you, that, that you should put why and how you're collecting ethnicity data in the funding application. 
um, with data collection, um, we our conclusion was that data collection for ethnicity data should be largely by self description. And that's not a, a recommendation that that comes only from this piece of research, but it's coming out from elsewhere. Let people describe um, what they think their ethnicity data is, as long as you give them a good idea of why you're doing the study and what sort of thing you're thinking about when you're thinking about ethnicity, um, people can do that. And people felt very strongly about, about that. There's quite a strong quote at the top um, of this slide about why um, people do not like uh, lists of, of ethnicity. Um, However, we recognized that in some cases it might be useful to have a pre-specified list in addition. And the reason I put that in red was because it was one of the areas where we thought um, this really needs a bit more research. There are pros and cons of having a pre-specified list of ethnicities um, in your data collection. But we would say always use self-description um, and possibly use a pre-specified list in um, addition communicate well with people about why you're collecting ethnicity data so they understand what you want. Um, and then for the team, um, we um, recommended three things. First, that people access training if possible, um, that the team talk to each other about um, how they're gonna collect ethnicity data and why it's important. And that there is somebody either within the trial or maybe it's within the trials unit to lead this work. Um, and the reason why we felt that was those three things were so important is because um, a lot of the, um, the, 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 the quotes that, that, that we've got now um, from our focus groups and interviews do suggest that there is a lack of understanding here um, amongst researchers about um, why people feel distrustful of research and therefore how we can um, get, get research that's better in that respect, that, that, that helps people um, not to feel so distrustful of what we're doing. Um, and then finally, in dissemination, um, we've said that obviously dissemination needs to be transparent and very often it's not. People will collect a lot of different ethnicities, but in the end, just report as white and other. Um, we need a little bit more creativity in that dissemination. And in all reporting, we have argued that uh, something on ethnicity should be um, included. And that's just the funding statements from NIHR. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sandra. If we were in a room, we'd all be clapping for you right now. <laughs> but as we're online, um, I'm sure there's thunderous applause in the background. <laughs> Um, we haven't had any questions directly um, in the chat right now, so we have some more general ones that I think we'll take at the panel discussion if you're able to stay for that. Um, in which I, case, I can see I can see some nice hands. Yes, just, just <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> so a great deal of appreciation for, for your talk there. Um, thank you so much. So I'm going to turn now to Dr. Adam Brentnell, who's going to give our second talk today. Um, Adam is a, a senior and experienced statistician at BART CTU. He's an expert in the design and analysis of uh, cancer detection and prevention studies. Um, and, you know, this is a really exciting and innovative way about thinking about how we can reach out to um, more diverse communities. So I'm going to hand over to Adam. You've already shared your slides. Well done. Um, take it away. Thank you. Hello. In this talk, I'm going to discuss um, a strategy for recruitment to clinical trials that aims to ensure everyone in society is represented in those who join the trial. It was uh, developed for the NHS gallery trial in collaboration with colleagues at King's. Right. The NHS gallery trial is a large randomized control trial of a new test to detect multiple types of cancer early. The trials being run in partnership between the NHS, the manufacturer of the test Grail, and the trials unit at King's. It's being run to see whether the test can help the NHS to detect cancer early, 
when it's usually easier to treat. I'll next, next give an overview of the trial design and then discuss the invitation strategy that was developed and applied. The trialists are seeking to show a reduction in the rate of stage three and four cancer around three to four years after the last person joined the study. For each cancer type, stage three and four are the most likely to be fatal. Participants who give blood are then randomized to either get the test or not get the test. And the trialists are gonna be able to tell if the test is effective by comparing outcomes between these two randomized groups. In July last year, the trial finished recruitment of just over 140,000 people, aged 50 to 77 from across England in a total of about 10 and a half months, which likely makes it the fastest recruiting trial of this size ever conducted. The recruitment strategy had two broad aims. The first aim was to ensure that everyone in society would be adequately represented. And historically, those who join trials are usually more likely to be wealthy and less diverse in the communities in which they live. We wanted to ensure that people living in higher deprivation areas were sufficiently represented, as well as diverse ethnic groups. Our second aim, was to account for likely healthy volunteer effects. It's common for people who join trials not only to be more wealthy than the target population, but also more healthy. And unless care is taken to account for this, the integrity of the trial itself might be at risk. This is because the sample size of trials is planned on the basis of the number of people who are expected to have the main event or outcome of interest. In this trial, sample size was judged based on rates of stage three and four cancer in the population of England age 50 to 77. To account for healthy volunteer effects, we therefore need to use strategies to ensure the trial is able to actually generate enough evidence for the primary analysis after four years. Some uh, earlier cancer screening studies, such as the PLCO trial, have allowed anyone eligible to join them and with effectively open invitations for all. This approach to recruitment is known to suffer from a lack of diversity and has healthy volunteer effects in those who join. Other studies such as the UK CTOX study um, required some people to be invited before they're able to join. This approach gives the trials more control on recruitment, but raises the question as to who should be invited. One approach, and the approach that was used in UK CTOX, is to randomly offer invitations to the population, your target population. So in our trial, it would be to randomly offer people aged 50 to 77 years a letter. But this would also not meet our objectives because those healthy and wealthy groups would still be more likely to be part of the study because they're more likely to accept the invitation. So in NHS gallery, we therefore deliberately selected more people to invite from uh, deprived areas. They're invited to book appointments at mobile clinics, like the one shown on this slide that toured the country. And the most important decision in addressing health inequalities in those recruited to this study was where this mobile clinic was located. The trial team helped to choose the sites by using local area statistics and this um, tool called Shape Atlas um, on the local population serving uh, potential sites, as well as considering things like ease of access. Once the site had been selected, we were able to use an NHS service called Diddy Trials to send invitations to potential participants who are registered with uh, general practitioners surrounding the site. The next decision to take was which GP practices surrounding the site would we invite people from? The decision to draw up a list of GPs was based on how close they were to where the mobile clinic was located, 
as well as, as, well as local logistics. For example, if the site was next to a river and you couldn't really get to it from the other side of the river, then only GPs would be selected from the side of the river where people could get, actually get to the site. Once the GP surgeries had been selected, we were able to identify the number of people registered with them by age and sex group. This slide shows an example where there are five GP surgeries surrounding um, a mobile clinic. The squares in this picture represent the size of each group eligible to join the trial. For example, there are more people in GP2 and GP1. There are more females than males in GP3. And in GP5, there are fewer older people than younger people. Our decision to take was who to invite from these uh, groups and GPs. To tackle this, we next rank ordered the GPs. We wanted to only invite people registered at the top ranked GPs first, and those at the bottom ranked GPs would use only if we needed to. In the trial, this rank ordering was based on how close the GP surgery was to the site and the ethnic diversity of the population within the GP's area. Once we had a preference list, we used an algorithm to automatically decide which people should be invited by age and sex groups within each GP. We sent a list to NHS DigiTrials requesting the number of invitations by GP, age and sex. This algorithm essentially invites people from the highest ranked GPs first. And once you've invited everyone, you would move to the next ranked GPs. Or if the invitations to GPs in rank one are likely to breach our healthy volunteer constraints, you also start to invite from rank two. The algorithm is um, a new approach to inviting people to trials not been used before, but mathematically it's not very new. For instance, it was used by the military in World War II to help plan resources in the United Kingdom, and is used today by many logistics companies. Um, but here we're just using it as an objective way to address equality and diversity, and to ensure the trial is likely to meet its objectives it can be run because it's an algorithm automatically, efficiently, and at speed and scale. Um, let's return to the five GPs and the single mobile unit. In the trial, there are actually 11 of these uh, touring the country. Invitations were sent in waves. In the first wave, we aim to fill about half the slots that are available on this mobile unit. Two weeks later, we'd sent invitations to those who've disappeared here, and we know how many people have booked. We now want to send another batch of invitations to fill up half the remaining slots that are available on the unit. And then two weeks after, if there's still space, we mop up the rest. This is a summary of that process that was used for each of these mobile units. First, the site location and details were confirmed. The list of potential GPs was drawn up and reviewed with local stakeholders. A first wave of invitations was sent about four weeks before the site opened, second wave two weeks later, and a third wave two weeks after that if we needed to. Um, the appointments took place for about four weeks before the unit moved off somewhere else and the process began again. In total, uh, more than a million and a half letters were sent by NHS DigiTrials to recruit 140,000 people. These are the locations where the um, mobile units went in about 10 and a half months. And the majority of invitations were sent to people registered with GPs in the most deprived areas of the country. So in conclusion, I've described what you might call, 
if you're me, a data-driven dynamic stratified sampling approach to trial invitations. The method that we've used to help address equity and in those included in the study is quite crude. It simply gives a greater opportunity to join the, to the, the trial to those groups of people who are expected to be least likely to join. It's unlikely to eliminate healthy volunteer effects, but is instead intended to help address study power by accounting for their likely impact on outcomes. And if this algorithm is used elsewhere, um, it's likely to be most effective as part of a broader strategy to address health inequalities in research, including involving patient and public in developing materials and strategies and design and behavioral science and many other aspects. If you'd like to know more about the algorithm, you might read our paper. The code we developed and used is fully available on GitHub. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Adam. And, and perhaps you and Sandra, if you do have any publications related to this, would like to pop the uh, links into the Q&A because we've had some queries about where people can, can read some more. Um, so we, we haven't got any direct questions about the presentation, but I think we can move on to a kind of Q&A session with, with us acting as, as the panel here. Um, so I've got the questions and, and Rian's kindly agreed to help sort of direct them to the right people and, and, and chair. Um, so first off, the, and please do feel free to continue adding questions into the q and I, I, I will check there as well. Um, but, but first off, got lots of trials, unit directors and statisticians here. Um, just on this theme of inclusivity, um, we, we have a real push for trials to be more efficient. Um, you know, funders want the most out of their money and they want their results quickly and they want them um, implemented, you know, for patient benefit as soon as possible. But here we're often talking about diverse communities who, with whom I guess we need to build trust, don't we, um, in, in order for them to want to sort of be involved in research. And I guess I wondered whether, um, or the questioner indeed, well, not my question, wondered whether um, you had any reflections on how we, how we get that right. I'm, I'm happy to start, Beth. Um, so, so one of the things about the push, um, for efficiency is I think it's not very well defined what people mean by efficiency. And actually often people think it's it's a, um, it, you know, it's a, it's a time thing. We've got to do everything quicker. Um, but I think it it is the case that that it's, um, I always like to think about it, you know, a trial is, it's a, it's a bit like a, a kind of balloon. You, you squeeze one part, um, you know, you squeeze the time in one part, it might make it, um, take more time in another part. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that in that in terms of of time, those um, the things that you do to make your trial more inclusive um, will will um, will take up more time. Actually, it, it it might be quicker because you've got the the you more likely to have the people that you want within your trial on board to start off with, and therefore you don't have to spend time thinking about the fact that you've got a problem later on. Um, you know, that 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 may not be the case, but I, I think we have to be a bit careful about how we think about efficiency and, and exactly what we mean. Um, and um, personally, I would say we want, uh, we want robust results over efficiency. <laughs> and so let's let let let's try and do everything to to get those. Um, and let's try and, and 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 define efficiency a bit better. I guess my, my only reflection that I'd add to that is that some of what we're trying to do with some of the work that we've done with diverse community partners in our local communities about building relationships. And so actually, it's not necessarily about a single trial for a trials unit. It's about building relationships that you you keep going with different community organizations and community groups. And so, yes, to start with, it may be an investment of time and effort. But over time, you become partners in that research, hopefully, and, and they input into what you're doing as you draw from their communities to make your research better. So I think there is an investment there that goes beyond a single trial. 
Um, Beth, we do have some questions coming yes. up the Q&A we, now. We, so we do. So um, a, a, another one for Sandra here about improving motivation among different communities. So did the communities make any particular points about what would make them more likely to participate in research? Yes, I mean, a lot of the conversations that were had were about that. Um, and I think there's a, there's probably a, a misconception that these communities don't want to take part in research. And, and that's not the, the barrier. The barrier is, 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 is often that they, they simply, I mean, some communities simply don't know. They don't know about research. Um, and so I think there is um, a place for um, trying just to make those links so that people will become more aware um, of research, but mistrust is 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 a big issue, and 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 because of the past, um, and you know some it's not so recent past uh, ways in which people have talked about and 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 approached research. So um, you know, I, I, and I think also um, I think uh, I'm not sure whether I I gave you this quote, but there's there is an issue about. Um, trust and building trust by um, approaching people not in not asking them to come into hospitals or into um, GP surgeries or, or into clinics um, but actually uh, approaching them where they are and through people that that they they know and 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 feel safe with so I think there's quite a lot of work that we can do around that. Fantastic. So the next question actually is for Adam. Um, so uh, there's an interest in knowing whether this data driven and dynamic stratified sampling has ever been used in, in other contexts, such as in the global south or in Africa. Um, so the questioner wants to know if there are any ideas on what criteria you could use to maybe stratify your sample population in, in another context. So how might how might this be used elsewhere? Um, well, I don't think it's been used elsewhere. Uh, I mean, one of the limitations is you, you do need um, good data. So if you want to know where to put a site, say you need data on where to put the site, you need to define what it is you're trying to do, a bit like Sandra was, was saying. So in this um, study, we were, the algorithm was rewarding inviting people from more deprived areas rather than less deprived areas. If in another setting you had a different measure of where you wanted to invite people from, you could use that. Um, it may not translate to all settings, though. You I mean, as you're saying, it has things. been used widely across different sorts of um, industries. So, um, you know, theoretically, it is quite adaptable in terms of the underlying algorithm. Oh, the, the algorithm itself. Yeah, yeah, you can use it for all sorts of problems. Uh, Brilliant. Deciding how to, how much um, mixture to put in a cake to make it taste best, or <laughs> how to root trucks. Great. So prior to this webinar, we actually had a number of submitted queries, which were around kinds of people who are really interested in how they might pursue a career in clinical trials. So thinking about, you know, what sort of background do you need to get into this kind of work? Um, and how do you find out about opportunities? So I wondered if the panel might be able to share any advice they have for people who are thinking about a career in clinical trials, um, whether that's, you know, from clinical trial coordinator through data, and most of us here are statisticians, um, so any advice that you'd like to share with, with those joining us today? Um, uh, well, if you want to, if you're interested in um, conduct of trials and managing projects and operational aspects, um, there are master's courses in clinical trials and clinical trial management um, these days. The, um, I think the London School operates one. I think UCL has um, uh, uh, an online distance learning one that is meant to be very good. Um, in terms of um, coming in from a more statistical angle as epidemiology degrees and statistics, medical statistics, although actually some of our statisticians come in from other routes as well, um, Adam, you came through operational research, is that right? 
Yeah, I never studied statistics. Yeah, but I found it interesting. And, and how about you, Richard? Yeah, I mean, in terms of statistical backgrounds, particularly, I think there is there is no single route in. I, I originally did a degree in maths and then a postgraduate degree in, in mathematical statistics, which was a very kind of theoretical discipline and, and but started working as a statistician in health research almost immediately. So I was working, I was learning on the job, which might not be the best way for a statistician. An alternative is, is, is a master's level program in medical statistics specifically which there are some fantastic opportunities available yeah um there is um somebody has um put a question in the chat um how can we apply for working with clinical trials um what background do we need as a qualification um and this comes from someone who's a biomedical scientist who's going to be start st starting a cancer related master's degree at qmul so I guess that's a, a one-year course, maybe, um, but they're looking to the future afterwards and interested in working with trials units. Um, what sort of routes do we have in? I guess there's a number of, of routes. We've had people come and work for work experience and do shadowing before. Have we got other examples um, from the Pragmatic Clinical Trials Unit, maybe, where you've... Um, I could answer as, as, as an as an ex-director to Go say for it, <laughs> <laughs> if you're motivated if you want to work in clinical trials um I, I so one of the ways would be just to contact somebody within a clinical trials unit and say you know can can I come and see what you do what goes on just to get an idea about things. I mean, I, 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 I don't know, Beth and, and Richard may say something different, but certainly when I was the director, if there was a good person who wanted to come and work in the clinical trials unit, I wouldn't have turned them away. I may have said, you need to go and get an MSc or you need to do something else. But um, if you wanna work in clinical trials, we always want you. Um, so I would say, come and talk to somebody. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we're always happy to chat about individual circumstances and people who are interested and excited about about clinical trials. I mean, I think that's that's kind of a given. I mean, if you're an investigator who wants to start doing research, then I mean, there there is a kind of collaboration process on, on our website. You can contact us to talk about your idea, and we'll, we we can give you some advice about whether it's ready to be a full clinical trial or whether you know there's some feasibility work that needs to be done first, and and we can advise you about how that might work. If you're talking about pursuing a career in clinical trials, it's worth thinking about where you fit within the the kind of team. I mean, clinical trials are not about a status statistician or a trial manager or a data manager or a chief investigator. They're about a whole team of people who come together to deliver a piece of work. And it's really thinking about how that aligns with your interests. And, you know, we're always happy to talk to people about how that fits together. Yeah. I, sorry, Beth. No, uh, go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> just because there's a question that's come up. That says, can an MSc in genomic medicine help with a career in clinical trials? And I think that um, if we think about our staff and how we got got to got through our careers so far, actually, there's a huge <laughs> diversity of different sort of academic backgrounds. Um, so I I think that any any um, any master's degree in genomic, you know, uh, health related or numerical, it, 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 it's all going to help. And everyone comes with different perspectives. And actually, because our teams are so multidisciplinary, um, I think there's, there's a space for, for people from many different backgrounds. So yes, I think also genomic medicine, of course. Um, I think if you're if you're interested in research, in asking questions, in helping to answer those questions, and, and improving kind of patient healthcare, then whatever your background is, there's probably a role for you in clinical trials. Um, you know, if you're interested in people uh, or, or, and or numbers, um, you know, there probably is a place for you. And you know, you can certainly develop further qualifications if that's what you need. As Rian said, there are a number of postgraduate courses that you can take up, but actually there's a lot of learning on the job if you're willing to start in a, you know, a clinical trials coordinator and some, and not every CTU has the same job pathways as well. So, you know, you may enter as a data manager and develop into a trial manager and our CTU trial management and data management are slightly different pathways. So you can sort of think about what might suit you personally, um, but you learn a lot just from being involved within the research community. 
And, you know, there are a lot of networks within the UK clinical trials unit uh, collaborations, the UKCRC, um, that can help people to look at different career pathways as well. So if that's something you think you're interested in, that, that's another resource that's worth checking out. Um, but you can always come and talk to us as well. <laughs> Um, I think that's it so far from the Q and A. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've we've covered the questions that were submitted um, to us online as well. So, um, unless anyone has anything else, I think we will leave it there. Uh, I can't see anything else coming up in the chat, so I, I think we can just thank our fantastic speakers for for today. Uh, another virtual round of applause, please. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks Sarah, Sarah for all, all our excellent organisation skills and bringing us together today. It's been a delight. <laughs> and it, well, thank you to everyone who's joined us online. It, it's a pleasure to see so many people interested in, in, in clinical trials. And, you know, we it, it's actually International Clinical Trials Day tomorrow. So you'll see more if you're on, on Twitter or LinkedIn or things like that from a variety of different trials units uh, celebrating the the, the, the the international day so if this is something you're interested in that that's more resource that you can tap into so you know thank you so much for joining us thank you bye everyone bye everyone